We are live. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, I want to welcome folks uh, this evening, <clears throat> those of you who are joining us on uh, uh, live stream through YouTube, uh, and also those who are on our call through our, our Zoom meeting. Uh, this is our um, a September board workshop, the Exeter Township School District's opportunity to uh, review our um, our upcoming uh, agenda for the uh, for the for the board meeting scheduled the voting meeting scheduled for next Tuesday. Uh, we'll also have a presentation this evening, uh, and also extensive conversation available, you know, among board members in terms of items, uh, not only the uh, the presentation that we're about to hear this evening, but uh, but also any items on the agenda that will require further discussion. We also invite our administrators who are on the Zoom call to help us um, understand maybe some of the, some of the uh, issues or, or topics that are listed on the agenda as well. So we're glad that you're join us, joining us uh, this evening. Um, so I wanna rem remind folks too, who are listening in that uh, you do have an opportunity to make a public comment and uh, if you'd like to do that this evening, we do have a, a, a part of the agenda, which is item three on the agenda, where public comments are heard. Um, and if you would like to submit a, a comment, um, please do so. I'm going to uh, ask Joe Way to, to kind of uh, review the, the process that uh, the public would use if they'd like to submit a, a comment. Joe? Thank you, Dr. Hamburger. Yes, uh, this evening, uh, you may send your questions or comments to questions at myexeter.org, and we will add them to a list and they will be uh, read during the public comment period. Great, thank you. Thank you, Joe. You're welcome. So the, uh, again, welcome everyone for uh, your attendance and for, and for viewing. Uh, our first item on the agenda this evening is a presentation. And uh, we have AEM architects, uh, um, Phil, Phil Leinbach and, and Michael Savage who will be uh, reviewing um, our plans uh, for a transportation center site uh, and the building uh, floor plan uh, for a project that uh, is uh, sort of uh, in, in, in process. So uh, I wanna turn that over to um, you know, Mr. Leinbach at this time, Phil. Thank you very much. And I'm, I think the easiest way is to move through the screen share. Am I able to do that again, Joe? Yeah, you are. Okay. And there we go. Okay. So I'm trying to get the pointer feature going here. So where am I? It's the annotate. So it's different from the last time, but there we go. Yeah. So this is the site off of uh, 562, just to the west of Watton Creek Elementary. And this was a drawing uh, where the project stopped back in April 2015. And what is highlighted in blue inside these clouds are areas that uh, we are proposing to modify from the design at that time. This area on the left side of the screen uh, currently, uh, or in the, the design when it ended, we had a fuel station in this location. But since that time, uh, a couple of buses have been added to the fleet that run on propane LP fuel. And so a separate fueling island will be needed for uh, the LP fueling in this location. So we're looking to expand the drive through area to keep the fueling lanes in line with each other. Additionally, we're going to modify the parking up here. Uh, previously, we had the uh, dumpsters in this location. And so the dumpsters move over adjacent to the building now is what they're proposed to. And we'll talk about the building footprint and how that decreased in size since uh, 2015 when the project was set aside. That really entails this next area here uh, where we're modifying some of this portion of the site because the building footprint has decreased. And we'll get into those specifics in just a little bit. 
Phil, could I just uh, ask you in the process yeah, here, sure. would you just be able to give folks a general orientation in terms of where this is located? Um, you know, where is uh, in proximity to the Owatton School, to Route 562, et cetera? Actually, if this test bar would move to me, and it does, and now we've got to get out of here. This is 562. This is the entire project site. The current elementary school is in this portion of the site. Um, the church property is immediately across the way here. The portion of the site that we are talking about is this westerly most portion of the site um, that is immediately adjacent to the elementary school. So north is up on the sheet in this little location map, as well as in the overall plan. So, and, and I think it's important just for anybody who's, you know, listening in on this and maybe seeing this for the first time is this is this is a projected project. This is a project that has not yet been uh, approved by the board. It has not yet at this point been approved by the Board of Supervisors or the Zoning Hearing Board of the uh, of the township. But it is a plan that, um, you know, we've asked you as architects to kind of put in place for us. Uh, and to, to see whether or not we can move this forward um, through both board action and through uh, the work with the township. So for, for anyone who's listening, I mean, this is a, this is a proposal that um, had been you know, considered a while back and has been recalibrated and rescaled you know, to kind of reflect um, you know, what we, we think would be um, most appropriate for delivering our needs of our transportation program. Uh, now and, and for this foreseeable future. That is very accurate and, and correct. And really the step at this point in time is just trying to develop the design to a standpoint that addresses all of the current and projected transportation needs of the district. Uh, the ultimate goal is with the consent of the board, the next step in the process is not to continue the design, but to go to the township uh, specifically with relief for uh, zoning uh, to locate the property here and to uh, provide them with something that's fully developed that we can answer those questions. And then if we have a successful uh, request with the zoning hearing board, then come back to the board and then with direction there, move forward and fully develop the design. Um, we're looking for efficiencies now with the design as well as accommodating needs that have changed since 2015. And so we'll, we'll get back to some of that here with regard to the actual building area uh, by extending the fueling island. If you wonder why we have the clouds up here, we lost a number of parking spaces that we previously had. They've been added over here. And actually the benefit of moving them out here, there's more parking for overflow events at the elementary. So it gets some of the parking that's presently within the gate uh, and the, the secure area of the transportation facility and make some of those parking spaces available outside of there uh, for increased overflow parking capacity there. And again, if any questions come up from any board members or administration, we can come back to any of these drawings at, at any time. The next slide here is a comparison of what the building was back in 2015. That is the upper portion. At that time, we had a building footprint of 12,400 square feet. And uh, overall area of the building was just over, just shy of 14,000, almost 13,800, including this mezzanine. The lower plan is a revised plan that decreases the area of the building down to nine, the footprint down to 9,950 square feet, including the mezzanine, the overall area is 11,115 square feet. So there's a reduction of about 20% of overall square footage. The footprint um, reduces by just a little bit more than that, 23%. Um, what was included before, if I can zoom in here and I'll work kind of left to right, which would be east to west on the plan. There was a wash bay with uh, automatic wash equipment. 
Uh, the equipment to support that was a little uh, addition onto the end. That little piece is gone, and this wash bay actually gets a little bit wider. We're getting rid of the automatic wash equipment, and there's space in there for portable equipment that transportation would use. That saves substantial money in the project. The remaining three bays then get narrower in the plan below. Uh, they do remain, and there was a question raised about the potential of having an alternate to bid the project and still eliminate a bay in the future, which is a possibility. Um, dollar for dollar, you're not going to decrease the building by the square foot because you're taking a lot of volume out uh, just by eliminating a bay. It does save money, but it may prove to be cost ineffective um, for what the district may need in the future. In any case, um, our recommendation, and thus far everybody has been in agreement, we're going to present what we believe is the worst case scenario to the township so we get the full approval, hopefully, with their consent of what we need to do. And then if some part or piece of the building uh, needs to be addressed separately in the future, we can deal with that in the second phase beyond the zoning approval. Um, this area doesn't change drastically as far as program. We did reconfigure it. We got rid of a corridor in here to create some efficiencies, but the support spaces air, support areas remain essentially the same. We have the mezzanine for parts and so forth. Um, we came up with some efficiency, efficiencies with transportation as far as the, the storage here for tire racks and so forth. I'll move to that lower plan right now. Um, mezzanine configuration remains the same. As you can see, the wash bay is wider, but that little addition for the wash bay equipment is gone. These three bays are narrower, and the overall depth of the building is also shallower than it was before. Um, this program, you can see the layout's a little bit different. The carter that went through here, rather than being isolated separately, is now all part of that main circulation. The driver's area, you can see it about 40 uh, drivers there in the morning when they're coming in before they head out to their buses. And I know on our last call, we confirmed the need for this space that any at any given time, as they're going between shifts and so forth, there could be 30 to 40 drivers in this area before they head out to their buses. They would park the cars out front of the building, access the building through this location, be in the driver's area before they head out to their buses. Secondary function of this is this could be laid out and used for training as well. We can get about 80 seats in the conventional layout. Some discussions about whether we need the airlock there or not, um, but that's a fairly minor thing to deal with in the future. Office area, file storage, a question came up that there are required files that need to be kept. I believe it was for the Department of Transportation and they need to be on site, so that is a locked secure area. Code requires that we have a janitor's closet, as does common sense, drinking fountains. Restrooms, we decreased the number of overall fixtures from what we were last time, I think, by one. Uh, so we saved a little bit of space in there. And then there's a small meeting conference room uh, for staff, for outside vendors to meet and so forth, and then a main office area. So really no luxuries there. A pretty straightforward approach uh, to a fairly simple design. Overall, the building design itself, another change that we proposed is to go to a single slope roof structure. Uh, it minimizes the number of pieces, should speed up the erection a little bit. It's not a huge amount of savings, but there is some cost to be saved there and still maintain what we need as far as the space for the, the uh, maintenance phase and uh, service phase as well. Again, some other sections just through, see the high bay area and the low roof over the office areas, trying to minimize the volume of the building as much as possible. The exterior of the building, again, metal siding, lower areas, masonry, split face block uh, for durability. It'll take the abuse at ground level a lot better than having dented siding and so forth. Um, a question was asked about fencing. There is fencing around the entire bus parking area. Um, four bays here. Again, we had talked about the potential of an alternate there. That's to be decided. We're showing kind of the worst case scenario with a build out here. 
the back side of the garage. This would be the driver's room and access to the maintenance bays. The wash bay and the second bay in would be the only drive through bays. These two service bays would be pull in back out. And there are some overall elevations then at the bottom of the sheet that we can look at later. Again, just a simple rendering of what could be done with colors and trim, metal and so forth. Everything sloping from the back uh, front of the road, front elevation to the rear of the site. We can collect all the water on one side and tie that into the stormwater system. A little bit more efficiency there with the piping and tie-in rather than collecting the stormwater on two sides. Project timeline, I'm not going to get into each little line item here. I know you've got a lot more on your agenda, but uh, basically we're in this uh, area of the project right now. Um, we showed the zoning variants start back in August. Basically, if you just took everything from this line and pushed it to the right one month, we're right here now. Virtually no change. Everything would just push out a month. We're looking about three to five months for the zoning variance process. So with board approval, anticipating that uh, next week, uh, the next step would be to immediately engage with board council who would represent you at your zoning hearing and start that process with requesting the appearance before the zoning board, getting the exhibits together, getting the information in and determining what variance or variances are needed. Uh, on the short side, if we can get this done in three months, then we can pick up this two months of time. If not, you can see how that kind of affects things. We've shown down here uh, that two months in this area. Regulatory approvals over all zoning being part of that. We also have land development that we're projecting at about six months. That is the gray line here. Um, that is about the turnaround that we're seeing with the County Conservation District right now. Highway occupancy permit. We would need that for the new driveway. It's currently an existing drive on the west side of the site that is emergency access only. That would be increased, obviously, for the vehicular traffic that uh, is shown there. A question was raised last time as to what our estimates include in those costs. It includes what is shown on the plan, which is some shoulder widening. If there is a turn lane that is required, that is not in the proposal right now. And again, when we uh, stopped the project back in 2015, we were just at the point that we were getting ready to submit for uh, the highway occupancy permit approval. So we don't know specifically what PennDOT will require. Um, we believe we have a sensible approach and that's where we will start. And hopefully they are in agreement with that. Building permits and so forth really shouldn't take too long. It's a fairly simple building, but we're looking basically the time frame driving the documentation is really regulatory. Creating the bidding documents is down here after the zoning approval with the authorization of the board. So we're looking at roughly three to four months to wrap that up. Bidding phase takes about a month for bidding and probably a month and a half overall for board action. We get contracts in and so forth. And then we're showing a construction phase we squeeze the end here to get this to fit on you know, 11 by 17 if you would print this out. But we're looking at about an eight month construction schedule to completion. By way of cost, just to give a little bit of context and history, in 2015, when the project was set aside, I had mentioned earlier the building footprint was 12,400 square feet. We were at a cost of about $3.4 million. 2017, that was updated to a cost of about $3.9 million. We updated and adjusted for inflation that exact same building up to 2020 as of this summer, and the inflated price is at $4.3 million. Taking the wash bay equipment out, decreasing the size of the building, adding the LP fueling station in, we are looking at an estimated cost of just about four and a quarter million dollars today. That is construction cost only. Uh, in 2017, we were running about 3.4% construction inflation. That is different than you might see with the consumer price index or COLA cost of living adjustment. Uh, that has been indexed off 
of the engineering news record index uh, for this area. With that, I try to move through a little bit more quickly. I am open to questions. Um, Mike can answer anything more technical. He's doing the hard work on the project. I'm just doing the thinking and talking. So any questions from the board or administration? So I have a question, this is Mike Chupina. Um, so the, the one of the bugaboos of the last time we went through this process had to do with um, perhaps not doing our due diligence up front around zoning issues. And the issue that occurred uh, several years ago had to do with accessory use on the, uh, of the property. So was the project um, that we were contemplating at the time um, in alignment with what is already there on the property? I mean, do they, do, does one need the other to function? Um, so we lost through the zoning hearing board. We went to uh, uh, the, the school district sued the township um, and lost uh, uh, in Berks County Court. So are you guys aware, has anything changed in the zoning policies or regulations since then? I am not certain that anything has changed with the zoning law. I think just some of the faces in the township have changed. And the hope is that there is a more positive approach from the zoning hearing board the zoning hearing board in this case has more power than the supervisors. Um, the zoning hearing board makes their decision and the supervisors are bound by that. Um, I have in discussions with Stackhouse Bensinger, the civil engineer, they concur that they felt that they could have made a better argument. Or the argument could have been made better and some of the opinion wasn't quite the same. I believe some of the zoning hearing board may have changed since that time. So that is obviously an argument that needs to be careful um, and made well, but uh, this is a function of the school district to provide transportation, not just to the Watton Creek School, but the Watton Creek School is a beneficiary of that. So typically, you know, my opinion is it would be accessory to the use of the elementary school. Obviously, it's a use for the entire school district and it's educational support in that regard as much as you'd have central supply, central storage, district administration. They're not necessarily directly teaching students out of Watton Creek, but they're necessary for the function of that building. So I think that case may need to be made a little bit better. Okay. And do we have a plan B? Uh, there is no plan B at this point. Uh, okay. Plan A is go with our hat in our hands to the township, try to make a better case. Um, this is financially the most prudent plan because it doesn't involve the purchase of property. Uh, Kerr Road, uh, if that's a question that comes up, is just too small and cannot accommodate what has grown substantially from the time that that began functioning as a transportation location for the school district. And do you know, I mean, you know, and again, maybe this should be safe discuss the motion but since you guys are planners and designers um you know given given that we're we're where we are right now with a with a virtual start and who knows maybe you know maybe a thousand kids will decide they like virtual and will you know stay virtual so um, have we factored in there or is there any flexibility within the plan if we decide that we get to a certain point um and we don't need as many buses or we don't need as much space because something else happens. I mean, is that a, I mean, it's a little far-fetched, I get it, but have we thought about that? We, we've talked about efficiencies in general, and the, the opinion, and I have to agree with it, is you get one shot at the zoning hearing board, and we're hoping to be successful in that regard, so we want to build for what we know today, and there is some ability for future growth with the bus fleet, van fleet, so so forth. It's not worth building exactly the number of buses and vans that we have right now. So there is a little bit of room for growth there. If we would find in the future that some of those spaces aren't needed, we're talking a relatively short time frame based on the schedule that we just presented. Um, I can't see us backing off of that today, um, but that's again something we would look to administration and the board to ultimately determine and say, 
this is a sensible path moving forward to do the full build out or a partial build out. Um, that's not for us to tell you what to do. We're not educators. And again, this is when we'd all love to have the crystal ball to say what's going on in five years. But I mean, my opinion is I don't see us getting away from educating students and buildings and needing to get them there and, and get them back home. So, um, you know, maintenance, upkeep, and planning for buildings in the future is still part of it as I see it. Is that scaled back? I don't think anybody really knows that today. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Bill, um, this is Hunter. Could you just give uh, the board a little bit of background about what we're actually asking for in a variance or what that really is from a 50,000 foot level? This Zoning 101, basically, the township is broken up into different zones, residential, commercial, business districts, what have you. Each zone has uses that are permitted. In a residential uh, zone, you may have certain size single family home lots that are permitted, certain amount of multifamily homes and so forth. And they are what we call as the use permitted by right. Within many of those zones, then there will be uses permitted by special exception. And often, even in residential zones, you'll have schools, churches, community type things that are use permitted by special exception. Sometimes you use permitted by right. Um, the question here is while we're an educational use, the transportation building isn't viewed by the zoning ordinance as educational in its function. And I believe the original building may have gotten a zoning variance and that's why we're kind of coming back again. We need an exemption from the zoning variance law to allow the transportation facility on the site. So the process for that is to go in a formal hearing, it's pretty much a, a court case, um, the township will present its side either in support of, neutral or against the uh, relief to the zoning and the school district will support its case of why they believe the relief should be granted. The zoning hearing board hears the arguments, weighs the evidence and makes their decision and there's time frames and parameters to control that. Once that decision is made, it's passed to the supervisors they are bound by that decision. And as you heard the last time, that was not favorable. The school district felt that they had a compelling case, took a comment or a uh, the county court and uh, lost at that level. Could I just ask you to um, maybe concentrate a little bit in on how the township comes to present a case against or neutral on the proposal that we would bring before the zoning hearing board? Well, they, they basically use the zoning ordinance as the basis to determine this is what is or isn't permitted, or if it gives latitude to the township to make a determination, because even though there's pages and pages of ordinance, not every specific instance is always addressed. Mm -hmm. And so it's when you get into these gray areas that we generally get in front of the zoning hearing board. Um, I'd like to think we could speak with the zoning officer in advance and speak with our council to see where the obstacles are because if we can identify what they perceive as the obstacles to this being approved um, we can make a better case or seek to provide evidence to them that we feel we're addressing those concerns um, there are things that we're going to have to do regardless uh, that the zoning is going to require us but the question is before we ever have a chance to do those we need relief to put the project at this location okay thank you certainly Mr. Leinbach, I have a quick comment and then a question. I wanted to say yeah. thank you to the committee for working on scaling back the original plans. And it's nice to know that we do have the option to continue working on those plans to maybe scale it down a little bit. I do appreciate that. Um, my one question, excuse my ignorance, can you define what a mezzanine is? I will do that with a picture, which is probably the best way. A mezzanine, Actually, this is probably the better one. In the building section here, this is a full bus bay, large open area, pretty tall space. 
a mezzanine is basically kind of like a balcony within that space that opens into that area. Within the code, it's got a specific parameter that typically it's an open area within that space that's no larger than one third of the size of the space it opens into. And why that is permitted is it doesn't add to my fire area with regard to calculating additional means of egress. If that would get too large, they would consider it a second story and I would need a second means of egress, a stair tower to it. If I had offices up there, I may have to put an elevator, those types of things. In this case, that mezzanine is, it's, it's more of a term of art with the building code than something we use every day. It's, it's really an interior balcony and we're gonna use it for parts storage. But, what, but it's not needed. Is, oh, is it, it it is, yes, okay. it's part storage for transportation. They wanna keep spare parts that they need to maintain the buses and so forth. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Is there anything further? Well, this, this is John Fiddler. I just wanted to thank you for coming back. Uh, we, we know you gave this pretty much the same presentation to the facilities committee. And uh, we, we just felt it was important that the entire board here. It's so uh, we're very, very grateful that you taking time out of your busy schedule and come back and, and uh, basically do a do a, a, a reprise of your uh, excellent presentation from last month. So just wanted to say thanks. You're welcome. We're detailed people. So we understand the need for clarity. Not a problem. Any other questions? <clears throat> Any other questions for Phil or Mike before we move on? Gentlemen, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very thank much. You very much. Have a good evening. Uh, thank you very much, guys. Good night, guys. All right. Uh, so we'll move along in our agenda. We're up to public comments. And uh, Joe Way, um, I'd ask, uh, have we received any, any comments from the public at this point? We have not. OK. So we're going to move on, uh, and again, we'll just be sort of acknowledging what's on the agenda for next Tuesday for our voting meeting, an opportunity for board members to kind of ask questions or make comments. Um, first item that will be on our agenda for next week will be the voting or the meeting minutes um, for um, actually three sets of, uh, of meeting minutes, as you can see in the agenda. Um, and then we'll be uh, looking at additional board actions that include the appointment of a board secretary, uh, item five, board secretary, and then the appointment of a Berks County tax collector um, or tax collection committee uh, or appointment. So that we would be actually taking a, our new uh, newly appointed um, business manager and appointing him as, as both board secretary and also appointing him to the uh, tax collection committee. Any questions about item five, board actions for next week? Okay, so the next area is um, board policies. And uh, Dawn Harris, if you're on the call, uh, would you kind of walk us through uh, first reading of the, of the policies that we have uh, on the agenda for next week? That would be the four policies uh, listed under item A. Sure thing, Dr. Hamburger. So I'll go uh, in order that they're on the agenda there. Policy 203 is our immunizations and communicable diseases policy. Um, <clears throat> the updates in this policy are largely pandemic related. So they're related to language related to our uh, new health and safety plans that districts were now required to create. Uh, also specific language in there referencing the actual Pennsylvania Department of Health. I guess one would assume that this, because this is a sort of uh, health and wellness policy that that language would have previously been in there, but it wasn't. Um, so now uh, the policy specifically references the Department of Health and the guidance that they offer. Um, there's also some updates in this policy related to flexibility and attendance related to immunizations, and that is largely because the Department of Health suspended immunization requirements, at least temporarily, um, back at the end of July, and so there's language in here related to that. 
the latest update that we have on that is uh, that it's a two month suspension, um, but we are anticipating some further communication from the Department of Health sometime soon about that as well. Um, there's also some language in here related to clarification uh, regarding FERPA and uh, student records and the ability of schools to be able to disclose health information during any type of emergency. <clears throat> policy 246, which is your school wellness policy, is uh, largely related to a 2018 update. If you recall, we're working off of some past PNNs in order to get some of these policies um, up to date again. And in that policy, there's actually a lot of options, bracketed options for schools to pick, but you actually selected most of those options back in your 2017 update. Uh, the main updates related to the 2018 revision center around the omnibus bill, omnibus bill of 2018 uh, and the requirement to add language in there related to safe drinking water and procedures for ensuring safe drinking water within school districts. Uh, there's also some optional language in there related to schools and um, voluntary environmental health plans as well. So Dawn, can what's, I just... a, what's a PNN? Sorry, <laughs> those are the updates that we get from PASBA. Um, they usually issue four or five volumes per year and it contains all the major policy updates that they're recommending based on changes in code, changes in regulations, changes in law, things like that. Okay. And if you get, if, if you- PASBA, if you, you probably should explain it for people who might be watching who don't know the lingo. Sure, the Pennsylvania School Board Association. Thanks. Sure. And just, I think too, I mean, the, the Pennsylvania News Network is the PNN and, and uh, that's updated uh, generally monthly or maybe a little bit more than monthly. It depends upon just the, the amount of new policies that are coming through. Right now, we seem to be getting a lot mm -hmm. due to COVID. Uh, so there's been a lot of updates, but in a typical month or two, we might see three, four or five new policy uh, changes, you know, that are based upon, you know, um, case law or changes in legislation. And you're right, there is an influx of change right now, some due to pandemic. Um, there's been a lot of changes related to Title IX, as we talked about during the last meeting. Some of those changes in Title IX also affect changes to other policies that we have, which will take me to the third policy on the docket, which is policy 247, the hazing Dawn, policy. Dawn, can I ask you to go back just a second to 246, to the, sure. the wellness? And I, I just wanna make a comment. Uh, you know, you mentioned there's a lot of bracketed optional uh, language that we adopted back in 2017. I, I would just encourage the administration to kind of go back and take a look at that bracketed language, um, and, you know, that the optional language for the policy, because I'm, I'm not so sure how much of that language has been incorporated to our actual practice, you know, here in the school district. And if, and if we're not going to follow the policy, you know, as it's written, um, you know, I'd be I, I would hesitate, you know, uh, recommending that the administration simply just go ahead and and adopt the policy language that was, you know, created back in 2017. Um, and we've had a couple of years now to actually be able to see it in its implementation. And there may be some aspects of it that maybe just haven't come to fruition or we haven't done or we maybe not even agree with anymore. Uh, it's a very comprehensive policy. There's a lot of, of, of expectation in terms of, you know, what happens, you know, in our buildings relative to, you know, wellness, whether it's food services or physical activity or, or you know, other sorts of um, aspects of wellness. So um, I, would just, I would just say, if, if, you, if uh, the administrator could just take a little more time and go back and just take a look at it carefully, not that I'm suggesting you change anything, but um, I wouldn't take anything for granted there. Uh, to that point, Dr. Hamburger, the uh, district does have a wellness committee as a result of uh, the policy changes in 2017. And part of the task of that wellness committee is to conduct an assessment periodically of the policy and its workings and compliance with the policy and making any determinations about revisions and updates that need to be done. Um, so I spoke to the folks who are actually in charge of the wellness committee right now. Uh, in the district uh, about, you know, just where we're at in general in terms of that process and how things have been going. And I believe they're scheduling a wellness committee meeting for later in the fall here. And so that will be a wonderful opportunity for us to 
add members to that wellness committee, mm -hmm. take a look at, you know, overall, you know, more comprehensive approach to, to all the different components in that policy. Okay, thank you. So th I appreciate that suggestion. Any other questions or thoughts about the school wellness policy before I keep going? Okay, um, 247 is the hazing policy. So there, are, there is some uh, recommended language change in here connected to those Title IX policies that were reviewed previously. But the majority of the changes to your current hazing policy, again, come from 2018. And they were driven by Act 80 of 2018, which was actually the uh, Timothy Piazza anti-hazing law. So if you all recall, um, it, uh, Timothy Piazza was a student who uh, passed away due to hazing rituals. He was a college student who passed away on campus related to uh, activities related to hazing, which prompted Act 80 of 2018. And so most of the changes here are comprehensive changes to definitions within the policy. Um, provisions of making sure that uh, through the athletic director and the athletic direction team that coaches and volunteers are aware of the policy, that policies are posted. Um, and there's a pretty significant section in here that I think is really important to highlight, which is the policy actually explicitly encourages the see something, say something practice for our students. Uh, there's direct language in there that encourages students that, that if they believe they've witnessed hazing or are aware of hazing activities, that they should re immediately report those activities. Um, the complaint procedures are also revised in relation to Title IX. So basically all hazing accusations should be treated as sort of a joint investigation with the Title IX coordinator and sort of work off the assumption that there is some type of discrimination practice involved uh, in the hazing ritual and approach it from that joint investigation and then parse it out from there. So if you recall, when Christine went over the Title IX stuff, I said that there would be other policies that we would need to update as a result of that. This is one of them. And then policies- Dawn, can I ask a quick uh, question? Dawn? Sure, go yeah, ahead. Go ahead, Dave. Oh, I just wanted to ask, uh, who's currently serving as our Title IX coordinator? Christine. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, I have a, a couple of questions. Wasn't the, uh, the Piazza case, wasn't that at Penn State? Yes. Okay. And yes, you're correct. Question, um, how widespread uh, is our hazing problem here at Exeter? That's a, I would have a little bit of difficulty answering that because I don't have a lot of historical knowledge right now about Exeter. I welcome any of the other administrators to chime in on that though. Well, I tell you what, instead of, I, don't, I didn't mean to put anyone on the spot, would it be possible to have a report uh, by next week before we vote on this, just to have a brief report on the hazing problem at Exeter, if one exists. Yeah, I can do some research on that for you. And I agree to discover or not whether or not something actually exists in terms of, you know, an actual problem, or if there's an isolated incident or two that's been reported versus a number of incidents that have been sure. reported. Great, thank uh, you very much. I back. just know in, in my tenure, I've never heard of any hazing, in any hazing okay, well, that's uh, good. violations of our hazing policy. Yep. And this is a policy that's been in place. It's not a new policy. It's a, right. just being up, okay. updated. But as you know, Dave, just because a policy is in place doesn't mean it can't be violated. So, um, so it'd be great to hear, you know, numbers of cases uh, and if there've been zero, fantastic, but uh, just interesting. I mean, I, I'm, John, I'm just going to say that anecdotally, I mean, I have heard through the years that there's absolutely hazing. So um, whether or not that's documented or undocumented, um, I would be very surprised if in a high school setting there wasn't hazing, um, whether it's reported or not, there's another issue. Sure. I understand. Okay. Thank you. I think hazing is one of those things too. I mean, it's affiliated with an organization, usually with an organization or organized group within the school system itself. Uh, for instance, right. like, you know, when a club or, or, or a sports athletics. team or something mm -hmm. like that. And or that's, a team. Or a team, team, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a condition of, of like membership. You know, you kind of go through kind of a ritualistic um, kind of process and hazing can right. sometimes be part of that. And, and I think one thing I, I'd, if you could find out on, um, uh, 
I want to be careful to phrase this as a question so I'm not accused of issuing a directive. Would it be possible to find out if um, on sports teams, if there's some kind of, even if it isn't hazing under the, under the definition in the policy, are there some kinds of rituals that, let's say, a freshman member of a sports team would have to go through, similar to what a, a fraternity pledge would have to go through? You know, e even if it's... Uh, I Mr. Fiddler, can I suggest that maybe that um, is a question that's addressed to Mr. Legath at the Athletics Committee? I don't know that Mrs. Harris would have oh, okay. that information readily available, but Mr. Legath might. Sure, okay, it does matter where it comes from. Thank you. So well, I have a quick question for you as well. What would be the repercussions of, let's say an athletic coach um, is made aware of a situation that sounds sketchy for them they don't say something and then it's discovered later that something was occurring that's a violation of the hazing policy. What would be the repercussions of that? I'll, I'll answer that to Mr. Ahrens. Uh, it would be a disciplinary matter uh, if they were in violation of the school uh, board policy or knew of a violation. Um, and then it, the, the level of discipline would be dependent on the severity of the incident and that would be handled through a model hearing, which is the procedure we use for disciplining school staff. I think the policy also calls for possible criminal uh, offenses if it was significant, if it raised to that level. For instance, Correct. if a student was, was uh, seriously injured. Correct. Thank you. Okay. And last one, uh, policy 705, our facilities and workplace safety policy. Again, the update is largely pandemic related. Uh, the policy did not previously include language referencing school health and safety plans. It now does. Um, I don't know whether or not districts will be required to continue health and safety plans after the Department of Health officially declares you know, that the pandemic is over. Um, but I see it being in existence for quite some time at least. So that's why there's the recommendation to add that language to the policy referencing uh, school health and safety plans. There's also language in there uh, referencing face coverings as well. Again, pandemic related in nature in terms of why it's being recommended. Dawn, there's also a, at the end of this policy proposal or this draft, there's some language that talks a little bit about whether or not you know, the district actually does have a certified workplace safety committee um, that is in operating. And if it's, if we don't, that we, we would not incorporate that final aspect of the guidelines, but, but apparently we do, correct? Yep, we do. Christine uh, heads up the workplace safety committee. Um, I happen to know that they're meeting tomorrow because I was invited to it. Um, so Christine's office creates the agenda for that. And in, uh, in viewing the invite for that uh, committee, it appears that there's a large number of stakeholders who sit on that committee. And that has to be kind of balanced between administrators and, and staff, from what I understand. There can't yeah. be more administrators and staff or vice versa. Correct. Balanced. There's also some community involvement on there. I believe I saw, um, I'm not sure if it was an Exeter Township uh, police officer or Central Berks police officer that's also listed on the invite as well. Okay. Thanks, Dawn. Any more questions? Any more questions related to any of these policies or discussion? Okay. Well, um, then just uh, just want to say that the the remainder of the policies listed on the, on the agenda um, on, on section B under six, uh, we've got seven policies that are due for uh, second reading. And these were discussed, had the opportunity for discussion last month and, and continued review. Um, you know, I would suggest board members, you know, continue to reflect on these policies. You have a chance if you haven't read them yet you know, go through that. I know Dawn does a nice job of summarizing the changes, but um, those changes were uh, on, on this section were reviewed at our last month's workshop um, meeting. Are there any questions about any of those seven policies?
Go on, thank you. Dr. Hamburger, just a quick question. Earlier in the week, or perhaps late last week, we were um, uh, in receipt of a, a draft policy around COVID. Is that not something that we'll be discussing uh, between now and uh, voting meeting? That's correct. Mr. I that um, that that was to be either a policy or a directive and in consultation with uh, council we've decided that I, I will issue that as a directive rather than as a school board policy so there'll be some modifications and I'll be sending that out internally okay so those of us who had concerns can still register them with you yes okay thanks You're welcome Okay, uh, so I think we'll move on uh, to item seven in our agenda, business functions, and I'll turn it over to Mr. Ahrens. Hey, Dr. Hamburger. Uh, there's just going to be, at this point, um, one major piece uh, to the agenda, and then some of the pieces that kind of explain um, a capital project list and, and justify the use of additional funds. So the, the first piece is a bond resolution that we'll be considering, um, or a parameters resolution, I'm sorry, that will be uh, giving the parameters to our council and also PFM so that they would be able to go out and borrow on the school district's behalf uh, in effect to refinance a series of bond obligations that we have. Um, I think they're in the range of about $21 million. Um, and feel free to correct me at any time. <laughs> Uh, and then there will also be, uh, and what's reflected in that capital project list, um, there's some of the future uh, projects that we intend to borrow for, which is the $3.62 million um, that we'll be adding on to that parameters resolution. The resolution is going to say not to exceed $30 million. We don't intend to go that high, uh, but it was on the advice of council and the advice of PFM to create that parameter for the ceiling so that when we go out to issuance, um, that'll just fit, I guess, what the, what the lenders usually look for. So that's all that I had. Anne, was there anything I needed to be corrected on there? Uh, no, what you said is accurate. When? <laughs> So, Ann, just a, a question related to that. I think the last time that we spoke to PFM, um, it was required that any new capital had to be spent within three years of its acquisition, correct? That's correct. Okay. So, I mean, just to, I will just go on the record as saying that there's no way that we're asking we're actually going to need or want $30 million, but it's put in there just for placeholder purposes. They usually, uh, in any of their parameters, resolutions will provide a cushion of you know 20% or a little more uh, just until they see how the transaction plays out. But in this uh, recommendation for new capital funds, it's the 3.62 million, which we've discussed at different times, uh, which will um, really address the projects that are in a uh, three-year horizon. It does not include anything related to, obviously, a transportation center uh, and any projects that are in a review phase. I mean, those things can be addressed later as a standalone issue uh, when the board feels it appropriate uh, to take action on that, but this, these are items that are primarily HVAC related, mm -hmm. um, and you know, sidewalk paving, roof restoration at Rifton. Uh, that is the the lion's share of the three point six million dollars. Just a, another question. Um, I think that correct me if I'm wrong, debt has to come due in order for us to sort of refinance that and, and uh, access additional um, capital. So when would be the next time, if I'm correct, when would be the next time that we would be able to do it after this process, if, if need be? I know it's well after you're retired. 
you can actually do a standalone issue, which, okay. you know, uh, obviously refinancings are a great opportunity because then you're only paying, uh, you know, Got issuance it. costs once. But this can be done uh, for future needs as standalone. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I, I just want to reiterate quickly um, from our last refunding that we were able to complete successfully that I think we saved the district hundreds of thousands of dollars in doing that. And I believe it was even over a million dollars. So this large um, chunk of refunding is important uh, that we uh, really act on quickly. And I would just encourage all my colleagues to support it next week. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Hunter. Any other questions related to this topic? Okay. Uh, thanks, Hunter. We're going to move on to item eight, which is uh, curriculum committee and Dr. McClendon uh, and maybe Patrick Winters want to cover this particular item. Sure. So um, one of the things that uh, is typically in place in school districts with the superintendent is the ability for any kind of grant or contract um, through PDE to be able to sign off on that grant through an electronic signature. And what is attached here is a resolution from the PA Department of Education that basically authorizes and directs Dr. Minor to do electronic signature. Um, it would apply to things like our Titles I through Four grants, our Safe Schools grant, the ESSER grant, those types of things. And so by adopting the resolution, you're authorizing and directing her to, you know, sign off electronically on on those agreements, grants, et cetera, that are through PDE specifically. Um, I think the resolution's pretty straightforward. It's, it's, it's standard, it comes right from PDE. It's what you know districts use for this particular item. Are there any questions? Thanks, Dr. Winters. Thank um, you. Dr. McLennan, any, anything else from curriculum committee that you wanna mention? No, are, are you going to be talking about the uh, uh, reading Fontes and Pinnell? So yeah. Are we going to be voting on that next week? Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Dr. Lennon. So that we had, if I may say, we at the education committee meeting that was held at five o'clock tonight, there was a presentation on the use of $200,000 of ESSER funds and $18,000 of ready to learn grant funds for the purchase of Faunus and Pinnell Classroom. It wasn't added to this agenda because this agenda was out before that meeting was out. But uh, if Dr. McClendon, if the committee supports moving that to the voting meeting next week, um, it would be added to the voting agenda and board members who didn't attend the education committee would be encouraged to watch that and to reach out to me or Patrick with any uh, questions they had prior to the voting meeting. Okay, so you're saying they should watch the recorded version of the uh, of the curriculum meeting that we just had? If they would like the full presentation, they could certainly ask me any questions. If you'd like me to give a brief summary of it uh, right now, I can do that as well. If I mean, I know you had a whole PowerPoint and everything, and so I think it'd be good if people did look at that, but if you could just do something very brief, that would be good. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So tonight at the five o'clock meeting of the education committee, um, I did uh, provide the the committee with a presentation about the purchase of Faunus and Pinnell classrooms, two components of uh, the classroom resource, which are the guided reading and the shared reading component. We do have funds available to us through the uh, ESSER grant, which is the grant uh, put out by Congress for schools to respond to needs that were created through the pandemic, including academic uh, needs that may have uh, occurred. This uh, program will be available uh, if purchased by the district to teachers to use in the virtual environment. And they'll have access to hundreds of titles uh, in terms of books, as well as in the brick and mortar setting, actual tangible books. The data in the district uh, supports a need for a resource that hasn't been there uh, previously uh, in both reading and mathematics, uh, which is indicative of comprehension issues that our students have. And uh, it's been over a decade since the district made any serious uh, investment in uh, literacy resources of this type. So uh, it's, it's a, 
an opportunity to do it. Uh, and I think it would be very supportive of our students, especially given the fact that we anticipate um, loss of learning from the spring closure that will, will put our students even further behind that uh, 2019 data that was shared. How's that, Dr. McClendon? Yeah, that's fine, that's fine. And I'll just add that, you know, I, I had heard about, about it from uh, Dr. Winters and then I, you know, was at the curriculum meeting, so I heard, you know, saw the Dr. Miner's presentation, but also I had also viewed, um, had opportunity to view the teacher uh, materials and the trade books that the, that the students would have access to. And so I, fu I fully support it and I think it's, it's needed and, <clears throat> you know, it's an excellent program. And, uh, be a very good tool for our teachers to have. So I do support it. Um, and it seemed like there were a couple other board members in our meeting that also spoke positively of it as well. But I, you know, as Dr. Miner suggested, you know, go back and look at the, um, the video of, the, of the, uh, her presentation on it. There's a lot more details and information on that. That's all, thank you. Thank you, Dr. McClendon. <laughs> We're gonna move on to item nine on our agenda, personnel, and that's uh, Mrs. Wilson. Hello, we um, will be voting on um, resignation of support staff um, and retirements of support staff next week. Also the appointments of guest teachers and support substitutes, um, the change of status of support staff and leaves of absences um, that are all related to um, the furlough, the su support staff furlough. And then also um, course requests and conference requests. If there's any questions about the um, leave of absences, does anybody have any questions about that? Okay, we're good then. I, I, don't, I don't have a question about that, Allison, but I'm just curious in general, um, and we don't have to hear this tonight, it could be another time. I, I'm curious to, to learn about the approval process. You know, we get a list of courses. Uh, that's the one I'm talking about, the course requests. I'm just curious to know, as I continue to learn about how the district operates, what kind of uh, review process, vetting process goes on before we get the list of courses to vote upon. How do we know that these are good quality courses, rigorous courses? And so um, I'm just wondering if we could have a, a brief uh, presentation about that sometime. I think Dr. Winters could just review that quickly now. Sure. Yeah. Sure, absolutely. So we, we have a pretty detailed vetting process. It, it starts with um, when a teacher submits a course request, um, you know, we look at whether or not it's acceptable into a master's program, first master's, second master's, looking at the contract language in particular in terms of what is approved. Um, if it's within one of their master's uh, programs and we've approved the master's program completely, then every course in that program is automatically approved. So, you know, if there's a teacher going for their first master's, which is, you know, allowable per the contract, then once that master's program is approved for that teacher, then every course that's part of that master's program is automatically approved. If it's an instance where, you know, a teacher has completed that first master's and they're taking additional graduate courses for purposes of column movement and growth, uh, we ask for a very detailed course description. We make sure that what the course is about directly relates to what they're doing in terms of their teaching and in terms of their uh, content area. And then Donna does all the checks and balances in terms of you know, making sure all of the detail is there as far as what they have to submit, making sure it's submitted on time. And then the final approval is myself. All of those requests go to me and then I double check them, look through them all, and ultimately, you know, uh, give the final approval. And if there are ever questions about, we're not sure if this one is correct, then that's something I would take to Dr. Miner and she and I would look at that, you know, together. Um, I would say in the last year, um, I, I can probably count on one hand um, the number of, of courses that have been denied 
simply because our teachers are really doing an excellent job of identifying courses that are of an appropriate graduate level and that are directly related to their area of certification or content area. Um, so the, the process is working very well and we have streamlined it. It used to be kind of approval by committee. Um, it was myself, superintendent, human resources, um, and Donna, and we've streamlined that process a little bit to where it's just myself uh, with Donna collecting some of the detailed information that, that I use to make that final approval. Great, thank you very much. I'm just curious, uh, again, my question, part of the question was about rigor. Um, I'm thinking of some of the graduate courses I took. Um, you had to do either a paper, uh, a program, a presentation, uh, one of the three Ps. Is that kind of thing still uh, required for a master's level course or am I just uh, showing my age by you know, admitting that I got my master's in 1975? No, I, you know, Mr. Fiddler, I, you know, I got my master's degree in the early 2000s and I had to do a thesis. So that, I mean, that's okay. not, um, it, you know, I mean, I, I would say, yes, most, most of your master's programs have some sort of culminating project, whether it's a thesis or a portfolio or, you know, some type of, of, of you know, activity or, or final summative assessment in that regard. Um, I, you know, I would say that as far as course by course, um, what the what the final assessment is in a course, I think it it probably varies substantially depending on what the area is. For example, if somebody's getting a master's in fine arts and they're taking an art course, that summative assessment is probably some type of small portfolio or some type of large, you know, art project related to that particular area. Whereas if somebody's getting a master's degree in English education, for example, it's probably some type of you know, larger research paper, or something along those lines. Great, thank you very much. You're welcome. I just wanted to say quick that I have a pre-existing familial connection to uh, one of the guest teacher candidates and I'll be supplying um, the letter required by board policy uh, for my abstention next week. Thanks for letting us know that, Hunter. Any any other questions for um, those items under the personnel portion of the agenda? Okay, if not, we'll move on to uh, section 10, student functions, and we'll turn to Mrs. Stratton. Next week, we'll be voting on a Wilson reading contract, uh, early graduation request, donation of French horn, contract with Kids Peace, and a non-resident student for 2020-2021. Uh, and I believe that non-resident student item is a report rather than a than a vote. So we, we uh, that's part of policy, I believe. So we won't be voting on that. Any questions about student functions? Any of those items? Nice to see a donation from community with the French horn. Okay, uh, so we'll move on to item 11, uh, facilities committee, uh, Mr. Fiddler. Thanks, Dave. Uh, we'll just have two items. Uh, one will be to uh, vote on the, uh, the boards or the, the districts proceeding with the transportation center variance process, which we heard in, in great detail about tonight. And the second item is some, uh, just some change orders uh, at the Jackson Wald and the rain uh, HVAC projects. What is, what is this, the status of that at Jackson Wald? Um, are we still, you know, I've kind of heard that it's a mess over there still. <laughs> well, I don't know personally, is um, Rob Prezui on the call? I certainly am. Hey, Rob. Good evening. How are you doing? wonder if you could fill us in. Sure. Uh, I think the last update was that the unit events were uh, delayed from the original ship date. Uh, as it stands now, uh, we have about 40 of the 61 unit events on site and are in process of being installed. Uh, the balance of those unit events, I believe, are due by the end of this week or next week. 
Uh, so we are pushing the contractor to get those installed. Uh, I've been working with the principals of both of those schools to uh, make sure that we are not disrupting any instructional time of teachers that have chosen to come in and uh, use their classrooms for their online instruction. So uh, they've been given the edict that uh, rooms that are available during the day, they can feel free to go in and uh, install these units, but ones that are being used by the teachers have to be done after hours. So, uh, you know, we're shooting for an October 1st uh, deadline there of all those units being installed. Great. Thanks, Rob. Allison, does that uh, answer your questions? It does. I was just wondering, like, uh, what, how much of the classroom has to be taken apart to get these units in? Well, right now we're at a point in most of the classrooms, I won't say all, but I'll say most, uh, where you know the, the, the teachers can occupy their classrooms and there's just a space where the unit event should be and is not, uh, but that's not uh, interfering with their ability to use their desk area for their, uh, or their whiteboards for the uh, online instruction. Okay. Great. Thanks, Rob. And thanks for the question, Allison. Yeah. I just wanna also say, John, that um, just so it doesn't come as a surprise to anybody that I'm not in support of looking for the variants right now. I just don't think um, it's not a priority for me right now. So I think we need to really focus on getting our students back to school safely and making sure that we're looking at their, any educational gaps that have might have occurred in the past six months. Mm -hmm. And um, just looking at a big project like that right now just doesn't seem right to me. So I just want you to no surprises next week. Okay, thank you. Can I um, ask a quick question about the change orders and kind of maybe take a little bit of a step back? Um, maybe we voted on change orders before. I was kind of surprised to see that the Pagoda Electric one is as small as it is. And one of the things that I've heard before is that sometimes it's very valuable for the administration to be able to execute change orders on their own without coming back to the board. Do we have a practice or a policy in place that permits that to staff or the administration to be able to do so? Well, this, is to to ratify. Ratify. this is to ratify the change orders. Some of these are time sensitive and we and um, Rob and I discuss them and they have we have to take action and give the go ahead. Mm -hmm. But in just some background in large scale projects, uh, a board may typically authorize administration to act on change orders up to a certain amount uh, of money, say up to 25,000 up to 50,000. But in, in these cases, um, they are immediate needs and that's why we're we're ratifying them. Okay. Theoretically, could the board have a policy around capital projects that said change orders up to $2,500 can be authorized by the administration on the board's behalf? Not a policy. Uh, however, maybe it's a good idea at the beginning of any project to, depending on the scope, to give authority up front. Because I know what I've heard before is that sometimes the change orders and the process of going through it can take more time and therefore money that could have been saved if the change orders had gone through otherwise. And oftentimes change orders have to happen in any type of project. So I, I would just think that it would be a good practice to have us regularly kind of walk through maybe a discussion around what change orders do we really need to see. Okay. Thanks Hunter. John, if I can ask a quick question. Sorry, to go off of what Mrs. Wilson just uh, commented on, what is the expense behind getting the variance at this point? Do we have an isolated expense to that? I, I can uh, provide an answer to that or an estimate. Um, back in May or June, the board had approved the addendum to AEM's contract. And included in that was the civil engineering, which is related with uh, Stackhouse Spenziger would assist in the variance process. And that would be up to $7,700, between $5,000 and $7,700. And uh, there will be no charge from AEM because obviously they've done a lot of the legwork 
back in 2015. Uh, the only other cost, uh, shouldn't say only, uh, a, a solicitor uh, or legal counsel would be involved in putting together the case uh, to present before the zoning hearing board. And I don't have an estimate of that. I didn't go back and look at what occurred back in 2015, but uh, probably the largest out of pocket would be this up to $7,700 for civil engineering. Thanks, Sam. Thank Can you, I, um, yeah. Mrs. Guidish. I appreciate that information because I, I do lean towards Mrs. Wilson's uh, feeling on all of this. Um, I, 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 we have used the term in the past that we feel like we keep kicking the can with this transportation depot. And, and I agree with that. And I know we need to do something. And had this not occurred with COVID, I'd have been in full support of definitely moving forward with this. But I just feel in, in my mind, putting a halt to any extra expenditure right now is something that's necessary. Um, but that's just, I just wanted to share that with you. Thank you. Yeah. I, I just want, I, we saw the, heard the presentation on the new tra uh, transportation center. Uh, I know that the current facility is in very poor condition and roof leaking and various things. Can somebody just speak to that as far as like how long can we go on with the transportation center the way it is without having to make some repairs to that? Good question. If we, sure. if we, put, up, if we put up voting on uh, proceeding with the variance, trying to get a variance, What's our time? How much time do we have on that before we're going to have to put money into that current transportation? Center? Yeah, I don't know if Rick Wagman's on the on the line here uh, for that, Sharon. But um, when I spoke to Rick uh, not too long ago, you know, he said that we probably should have put a new roof on that building by rights about seven years ago. Uh, that is a rubber roof, uh, and right now with inflation, it could cost anywhere between seventy five thousand and hundred thousand dollars to put a new roof on that building, and I, but he also said since I think 1993 that the, all the boards since then have been reluctant to put any money into the, into the building because it would just be essentially wasted money, uh, that the building has no real future, you know, uh, for us. And that, you know, the hope and the goal is, is to construct a new, to find a new location and to, and to have a new facility available for transportation. Um, but, you know, the idea of putting a hundred thousand or more into that building is really a, uh, really tough, but when you take a look at what's happening there, um, the walls are, are um, now being saturated, from what I can tell, with moisture from the roof, and there's an active uh, leak that's in the bay, one of the bay areas that's kind of really crudely set up with a, um, a collection, you know, piping and that sort of thing to kind of keep it at bay. Um, so, I mean, good points about that. Um, but I guess my question too, and this is a question for Anne, uh, is, and maybe maybe you know this, Anne, is that if the board is able to kind of move forward with requesting a variance, um, and and let's just say that a variance is granted, how long can that variance sit uh, if the board chooses to delay the implementation of the of the project? I mean, can it be a year? Can it be five years? Can it be ten years? <laughs> I'm just curious. I mean, is the variance require the implementation of a very specific timeline for completion, or can it be done um, at, at any time, recognizing the variance is, kind of represents a permanent change in status? I can get a definite answer on that, but the, my understanding is that as long as the scope of the project that you've presented to the Zoning Hearing Board, zoning hearing board doesn't change, uh, then you know it, it, it will be there uh, for the district to, to you know to utilize when we're ready. But I'll get a definite answer uh, yeah. or confirmation from Phil Leinbach. I think that would be really that. helpful because you know I think you know we all sort of understand that the conditions there are so many things uh, that suggest that the conditions are really good. You know right now a, a very positive relationship with the uh, with the township which hasn't always existed. And taking advantage of that opportunity right now, you know, might be to to the district's benefit in this particular case, even if we're not prepared to move forward with the project. 
I just want to echo what Dave just said, because I think if we're able to find the ability to utilize our land in this way, um, either next year or three years down the line, I think we have a responsibility and an obligation to do that. Because I think really we need to find resolution on this issue. We know we need to have a facility for transportation. We currently have one that's dilapidated and has very significant structural challenges. And beyond that, if we were to do major renovations, it's my recollection that there are significant code violations that we need to try and address. And it's not guaranteed that the township would be able to grant us relief through all of those either. So I think we really need to have a resolution here and you know, I think Mike, you mentioned earlier, you know, what is our plan B? Uh, I think this is plan A because this is the best plan we've got. Um, we've looked at other options and there are significant challenges with the construction of a new facility on land that we would purchase um, with potentially retrofitting, retrofitting one of our buildings to allow that use. Uh, and I just think that there are an abundance of challenges, but really, I think it really comes back to our ultimate responsibility is to have in this situation, a transportation facility. And we need to figure out the easiest and fastest way to get to there um, at the least expensive amount. And I just don't see how we're gonna find something that's gonna be more cost efficient than this project. I think there are more things that we need to do uh, down the line to look at the cost of the project, especially related to the land configuration that they've proposed. And that's something that we talked about in the facilities meeting. Um, but at this point, I'm not sure where another concept is gonna come where we have the availability of money. You know, Allison, I definitely hear your point uh, regarding right now um, and even in the future with our other responsibilities, but I think we really need to make sure that we're covering all of our bases and that includes this one. And we need to continue steering the ship forward through this pandemic um, and we can't neglect responsibilities that have already been neglected for many, many years. And I think we really need to look to find resolution here. Okay, th thanks folks for that discussion. Um, if we're ready uh, to move on in the agenda, I, just before I'm, we adjourn, I am uh, required to, to notify folks that uh, this evening, earlier this evening, we had an executive session uh, primarily to address sef safety and security matters. Um, and the Last thing, one of the last things I want to just uh, add is uh, to ask Joe Way whether or not we received any additional public comment uh, since our meeting started. I know we don't have a sp spot on the agenda, but I think in fairness, um, you know, if anyone has submitted a, uh, a comment, it would be, uh, I think it'd be appropriate to hear it at that time or now. We have not. Okay. Uh, thank you. And so finally, uh, are there any board members who seek to be heard at this time before we adjourn? Dave, are we going to, um, is it okay to say, I don't know how to say this, <laughs> being wrong, that we discuss the possibility of trying to have a board meeting in person and that that's something we are discussing and throwing that idea around? Yeah, well, let me say, um, we are planning on having a, a board retreat uh, and that'll be just with the board members. And uh, that may be a, that may be a, a, I mean, all, all types of board functions will be, you know, subject to our conversation in that retreat, um, how we operate as a board. And I think that would probably fall under that area. So if folks are comfortable, you know, discussing it at that time. Um, I know that we've already kind of, discussed a little bit with uh, the administration, you know, some of the logistical, you know, issues that might be associated with that. And I think we wanted to kind of give, you know, them an opportunity to maybe work with some of the other board members and kind of maybe helping to set up an idea or a concept for how we might be able to have public board meetings. Um, so I think there's more to, there's certainly more discussion on that. And that is, I think, a, a goal that we do have. Uh, I will say, I think there can, may continue to be some board members who are not quite comfortable yet, you know, with, uh, you know, in person. So continuing to offer the opportunity for, um, you know, a virtual involvement in a board meeting is probably preferred by some. 
So more, more, more to, uh, we'll discuss that in more detail, I think, later. Thanks for bringing that up. Dave, I have just uh, two things. One is um, I would like to just thank our families, thank our teachers and our staff for uh, their flexibility and, and how everybody has adapted to, um, you know, what they're going through right now. Um, you know, it's a great degree of flexibility and appreciate what people are doing. I'd also like to let people know that there is an athletics committee meeting Thursday evening at the 6 p.m. Um, there is a Zoom link associated with that and that uh, the public is invited to participate in that meeting in the same way that they participate uh, in these board meetings. Thanks, Mike. You're welcome. Just any other any other comments from board members before we adjourn? Clarity on that, that I think that the um, Mr. Legath, Mr. Tapina, correct me if I'm wrong, said that those would be aired um, on YouTube the same way these meetings are aired, and we would uh, you know submit comments and those sorts of things as well. So people don't have to have a Zoom link to watch; they can participate in YouTube and submit their comments and questions as well, like they do for these meetings for the activity. Thanks for the clarification. Okay, so um, this is not a formal meeting, so we can adjourn at this time and uh, we'll, we'll be picking up this agenda next Tuesday at our regular board meeting at seven o'clock. Thanks everybody for participating tonight. Bye. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Have a nice night.